Good evening, everybody. Let's look at our prayer list tonight. Carolyn Fanati, she was in Lakeland Regional, but she's home now. Had a blood clot in her lung. Ava Megger, Lakeland Regional, complications from Parkinson's. Amber O'Hara, North Carolina Hospital, the daughter of Harry Taylor. She had a heart attack. Larry Archbell, uh, bursitis in his left hip. Um... Dean Coleman, upcoming heart surgery, friend of Linda Vitale's. Right hand side of the page, David Kelly, heart problems and other medical issues. In back page, Wayne Sellers, recovering from hernia surgery. Okay. Don Gamble, possible surgery to repair a knee replacement, any damage in a fall. Melita Jagir, scheduled for anchor surgery on Friday, March the 19th. Glory Guy, upcoming test on liver and kidney. Tom Johnston, scheduled for carcinoma surgery on March the 15th at Moffitt Cancer Center. Brother Joan Gamble, Stephen Carey Simons, personal and family requests. Linda Vitale, personal. Let's not forget Miss Sherry Hargis' funeral is going to be this Friday at 10 o'clock here at our church. She's a faithful member of our church. And um, I encourage all of you to be here. If you can, I want to read just a little bit from the beginning. We've had 51 people now sign up for the hour that changes the world. Okay. There's just a couple of paragraphs. I'm going to read that Dick Eastman said, if you're not signed up for this, I don't want you to sign up just because you get a free book and then not come every Wednesday. Brother Mitch and I will be teaching it. We're kind of team teaching together. It says this. I grew up singing the old hymn, Draw Me Nearer, and particularly recall the stanza that begins, Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. Yet I was not until, it was not until my mid-thirties that I discovered how this delight could touch every day that I lived in a practical way. That discovery changed my prayer life. Moved by Christ's appeal to Peter in Matthew 26, 40, Could you not watch with me one hour? I embarked on a journey 
a blessing that has touched every touched every day since. 25 years ago, this simple challenge to set aside one hour a day to be with the Lord in His Word was born. It resulted from those early days of seeking to develop a consistent daily devotional hour. Because of a special burden for the world evangel evangelization, my hour included a plan to pray for the nations each day, thus becoming a daily hour that led me partner with God in changing our world. That's what we need to do, right? Every movement of God has started with prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. You're gracious and kind to us. Lord, we do pray that not only would this hour change the world, but that we'd spend the other 20, 23 hours trying to change the world as well. Father, we understand that it is important for us to spend time with you. And Lord, whether it be an hour a day or half an hour or 10 minutes, Lord, we realize that many Christians do not spend one minute a day with you. And Lord, we pray that right now if we would just understand, help us to understand that it's by prayer that lives are changed and that the world has changed as well, especially our world, the world that we live in. We love you now. In Christ's name we pray. Let's stand together. We're glad you're here, and let's just celebrate together, shall we? I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord.
service today. God, we want your name to be glorified in everything that is said and sung and done as we worship you. May we ever be mindful, that's the reason we're here. Well, we want to hear your word, but more than that, we want to get in touch with you. So, Father, bless this time we'll spend together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. to spend a little time tonight uh, looking at Elijah, who is one of my favorite Bible characters and uh, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. And we have been kind of going through some of the most uh, famous or popular or favorite Bible stories that people have heard uh, since they were kids. So give me a chance to get my ribbon and not lose every piece of paper I have. I got, I got five Bibles in this one Bible. All right. So I want to kind of put you in a couple of verses tonight, but I'm mainly going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18. And as I take us there, um, really the story of Elijah is so powerful uh, for many different reasons. He is one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. He is, again, one of the few in the scriptures that never tasted death, taken to heaven in a flaming chariot. Isn't that how you'd like to go? Man, I'd like the Lord to send me a flaming chariot and say, get on board and let's take off, up, up, and away. And so Elijah, to me, again, is one of my favorites because he shows back up in the New Testament with Christ on the Mount of transfiguration and we believe that maybe in revelation when the two witnesses show up to literally tell the world uh, you're coming to an end and this is your last chance uh, we believe that it could be uh, Elijah and Moses and we have a lot of different reasons why we would believe that but tonight I wanted to start before I get into Elijah's whole story about his prayer and about this contest with the Baal prophets and what he does, 
is give you a verse in Matthew chapter 19, and you don't have to turn there. It'll be up on the board, Matthew 19, verse 26, and it will be from the Amplified Version. If you could put that up for us, Brother Ken. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible, but all things are possible with God. Now, if you look at that verse just for a moment, in the second verse where it says, and this is impossible, every time you see those two letters, I am in front of a word, it means the complete opposite of the word that follows it. So when you see impossible, it's telling you it's possible, but this is the reverse of it. So what we wanted to be taught by Matthew or the words of our Lord is Jesus said, with men, this is impossible, but all things are possible with God. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, again in the Amplified Version, it says, for with God, nothing is ever impossible and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. With God, all things are possible. That's really what I want to talk about tonight. Because really, as we look at all things are possible, Elijah's name even has a few different meanings. Elijah means my God is Yahweh. And many of the early Hebrew scholars did not like the fact that he used the secret name for God, Yahweh. And so they have kind of moved it around or uh, fudged on it a little bit. And they came up with the fact that he didn't really say my name is Yahweh, but Elijah means uh, my God is Hashem. And Hashem means the name. So my God is the name. And he did that because you can't use the Lord's name in vain in the Old Testament. And so when he said, uh, my God is Yahweh, the secret name of God, they believed that he was using it in vain. So they changed it around to say, not my God is Yahweh, but my God is Adonai. My God is Hashem, the name. And we know that his name is powerful. We know that it is I am that I am. And we know that because of that, um, when he speaks those words, uh, literally all of heaven just stops what they're doing. And I would almost believe that all of creation perks up when they hear that name, I am. And when we understand how powerful that name is and that God has given us his name, and we can call him Jesus or Yeshua, which means grace or salvation. Uh, last week, we looked at Joshua, and we saw that Joshua was given a pep talk, and he was to be strong and courageous. But I want to look at the man Elijah for a few moments because he really does have some really neat characteristics or uh, character traits. He, he has a personality. That's what I love about the scriptures when it gives us the idea that the person that we're reading about uh, has a personality or a sense of humor or they have sarcasm or any of those kind of uh, emotional things that are going on in the word. And he definitely had that because he had challenged the Baal prophets. If you remember, Elijah prayed and it, ha it had not rained for over three years. Now, it says over three years, but in one place in the scripture, it says three years and six months or three and a half years. And in another place, it says over three years, and it doesn't actually say three and a half, but you get the idea that it was over three years that they had a drought. And these folks were farmers. They lived off of their harvest. They basically were not able to feed themselves or their animals. They didn't have enough water basically to live on and they didn't have enough water to give to their animals. So everybody was starving and everything was dehydrated and the land was dry for three and a half years because Elijah had prayed that God would shut down the heavens and God shut down the heavens. And Elijah challenged the Baal prophets to this contest and he told them that I know that my God is, is all things are possible with him. And so he let the Baal prophets go first. Now, I like that about 
him because he didn't want to show off first. He wanted the crescendo or the buildup. And so he said, why don't you 400 Baal prophets start crying out to your gods and you ask him to take your sacrifice. So they built an altar. They put an ox on it. They said, uh, call down fire from heaven. And if your Baal prophets and all the gods that you worship are able to do that, then we, the children of Israel, will worship your gods. But if your gods are not able to do that, then I get the last chance to call upon the name and so they start crying out. They start cutting themselves. They do it night and day. And then just Elijah just gives them these digs during the whole time. Maybe shout a little louder. Your gods might be sleeping. You know, wake them up. Shout a little louder. Make some more noise. And they were cutting and screaming and carrying on, trying to get the attention of the Baal gods that were, again, supposed to hear them and answer their prayers. And so after all this time, nothing happens. They get tired. They sit down. Their gods have not answered their prayers. And basically in Elijah chapter 18, we kind of get an idea beginning in verse uh, 30. Elijah begins to tell the people some things that they need to know. And in this process of telling them, what they need to know, it tells us a lot about what Elijah already knows. Now, I think there is a difference between someone telling you something that they know and you knowing it for yourself. And so Elijah calls the people, beginning in verse 30, and this I'm not using the Amplified. Thank you, Ken. You are on it. New American Standard Bible. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. You see, when the Baal prophets came along and they started worshiping other gods, they believed that the higher you built the altar on a mountain, the closer you were to God. And so whenever you see in the Old Testament that the altars were in the high places, that meant they went up to the highest point in the mountain that they could get to, and they would put an altar there thinking they were getting closer to God. And then they would tear down all the other altars that the Jews had, had built to make sacrifices to God. And so they had torn down this altar, and now Elijah is telling them that I, I want to repair the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And so in 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Israel means one who strives with God. And Israel, or Jacob, is one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob had to have a name change to Israel because he was not willing to let go of the angel of the Lord until the angel blessed him. And when he did, he changed his name to Israel. But Jacob, being the trickster that he was, and like others in the Old Testament, they always wanted to know, what is your name? They would ask the angel that all the time. What's your name? You know, so they could have some identity attached to this angel. But we don't get their names. We just get the angel of the Lord. And for many of us, in some cases, we believe that it is Christ incarnate, Jesus showing himself to the people um, as an angel but he ate with them and sometimes would drink with them and they would see him and then he would be taken up into heaven and they would say, we know that we have been in the presence of the Lord. That's what happened with Samson's mom and dad and it happened with Abraham, with his brother, uh, uncle uh, Lot and we know that there were other times that the angel showed himself and they were amazed that the angel of the Lord would do that. And so Elijah wanted to rebuild this altar and use the 12 stones and understand that Israel shall be your name because the children of Israel had begun to worship the Baal prophets. They had taken on not only their culture, but their religion. And that's what really happens in a culture 
when you don't have a firm foundation, and if I could be or extrapolate and say that because our culture today does not have a strong foundation on God, they're subject to be formed by the culture in which they live in, which is there is no God, or I'm God, or there is no God, and if there is a God, then they ask the questions, well, why does he let people suffer? Why does he let people die? Why does he do the things that he does? Why does he do it to me? Why did he let it happen to my family? And people then begin to doubt, and they have a crisis of faith. I've had a few people in the last week call me and say, can you call my son and talk to them? Can you speak to my husband? He's really struggling because he's really wondering, is there really a God? And so the culture is trying to change, or I should say they evicted the Ten Commandments from the classroom and a moment of prayer, and we can see how that's worked out for our school system. We're graduating geniuses left and right, aren't we? And so we see what's happened in that realm and arena, and we know that they're trying to do that in college. They're trying to do it. Um, on baseball fields and in other places, and they have told uh, graduates that they're not allowed to uh, mention God or give Jesus the glory or mention him that, uh, that he's their savior and that he loves them. Um, they're trying to silence us from mentioning even the name because once you hear his name, it elicits inside of you something that God placed inside of every human being, which is a God-shaped void that wants to know him. And so when you hear the name of Jesus and you hear the name of Hashem or God or my God is, is Yahweh, uh, people get very uncomfortable. You know, they tell us, don't talk about two things. Don't talk about what? Politics? And don't talk about religion. Well, I could live without the first one, but the second one I can't. Because they don't want to hear about what we have in Christ because then you are confronted with the truth. And the truth and the light brings forth sin. And it brings it to light. I heard something, and I'll probably say this for the rest of my life. And so if you hear me say it now, you probably hear me say it every time maybe I'm in the pulpit. But I heard this great description about a question that a person had. And they were having a crisis of faith. And they said, you know what? Um, I really struggle with the idea of uh, good and evil. And the man understood what he was saying, and he said, there's no such thing as evil. And the person looked at him like, wait a minute, I'm not following you. I thought you believed in God. And he said, I do. So let me tell you what I believe about God. He is good. He is kind. He is merciful. He is forgiving. He's loving. He gives people grace and mercy. He cares for them. He loves them with all his heart. But if you have the absence of all those attributes of God, you're left then with evil. And then he gave them the illustration. You know what? There's no such thing as darkness. Because darkness can be explained as the absence of light. And so when you have someone who says they do not believe in God or his attributes, what you're left with is evil. But if you believe that there is goodness and love and kindness and mercy and forgiveness and a joy and a peace that only God can bring, well, then evil does exist when there's the absence of God. And evil thrives when there's not that presence of God or the attributes of God being proclaimed by the people of God. We need to just tell people God is great and our God can do all things. All things are possible with God. There's nothing that is impossible for 
him. And so, again, Elijah is trying to tell them a teaching and a principle that will change the direction of the culture in which they have immersed themselves in, which was to be idol worshipers instead of worshiping the great Hashem or the great name, the God of all gods, the king of all kings, Yahweh. And so he tells them that he's going to rebuild the altar. He's going to put 12 stones there representing uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then verse 33, then he arranged the wood and he cut the oxen pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, go and fill uh, four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. So there's the sense of humor and, and really the confidence that Elijah had. Was, you know what? You prayed while it was still dry. There was no water, right? We have had a drought for three and a half years, and you've cried out to your gods all day, all night. You're just making noise that he's not listening, he's sleeping. But I want you to know that if you can get what little water we have and pour it on this offering and on the wood and everywhere else, and it fills up the trench with water, when I call upon my God to do what I know he can do, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that all things are possible with God. So let me tell you a few things about the man Elijah before we go to the actual contest that uh, begins in verse 36. Elijah was just a man. We have to remember that. He was not God. He was a man, but he was a prophet. He was a faith walker and talker. He had faith. And he talked about it. He walked the walk and he talked the talk. That is a lot different than what we have today in our culture. We have folks that talk the talk, but they struggle with walking the walk. And when you have struggles with walking the walk, well, people may not listen to what you have to say. It sometimes really discredits or really just kind of turns people off, especially I could tell you that in my own family, when I got saved because I was such a bona fide hell-raising pagan, uh, when I became a believer and started telling all my family members that I got saved and I gave my heart and life to the Lord Jesus and he changed my life and I'm a different man, uh, they said, we'll see. Let's see how long this lasts. You're going just through a phase and we like the old Mitch that always was high or always was drunk or always was cussing or always was running around and doing the craziest things possible. And as time went by with each year, my mom saw that that never changed or I should say that I had changed. My brother saw the change. My sister saw the change. And then my relatives heard that, you know what, Mitch is a lot different than he used to be. Remember when he was crazy? Now he's a different kind of crazy. He's become like one of those Jesus crazy people. And if he comes around you, he's going to start talking to you about Jesus. And so they stopped inviting myself and my wife because I married her six months after I met her uh, because I couldn't wait any longer. Um, and so uh, I wanted to marry her and they didn't invite us to anything. Because they knew that if I was invited to a family event, eventually, when there was a moment of silence, I would share with them, can I tell you all what's happened to me? Because you know the old me. You know how I've come to all of our family events just so stoned out of my mind, wasted, just wanted to, I got high while I was even at your events. I would go out in the front yard, backyard, I would smoke the joint in your bathroom and you'd wonder that's not the aerosol that we bought it smells like something was burning and then I would walk out and I was happy and I would want everybody to get high and I would try to get all my cousins high and everybody that I could I would try to get them to do whatever I was doing and they said Mitch is different different kind of crazy he's crazy about his Lord and so they didn't invite us to any weddings any bar mitzvahs, any funerals, nothing. We were 
we were kind of, you know, just anathema. We, we just, you're not allowed to come. They actually would say, don't come, don't show up, which that kind of is like not the best thing to say to me. <laughs> even as a kid, don't do that. Oh, I want to do that now even more than ever before. The, you know, and I'd say, really? Okay, sure, I'm never going to do that. And as soon as I had the opportunity, I would do that. So I want to tell you, he was a prophet. He was a, a faith walker and a faith talker. Secondly, about Elijah, he understood the mission that God had called him to. Not only was he a, a man, but he was a man on a mission. And in 1 Kings 18.30 that we read, his mission was to bring God to Israel and bring Israel back to God. That was his mission. You see, I think that that's really our great commission, is that I don't believe that it's God's will that any should perish. I believe he wants everyone to come and know the saving grace and love and mercy uh, of Jesus. I, I just know that, that that's God's heart. And so our job is to not only share Christ with someone, but is to bring that person to Christ. And if they ever met him, if they ever opened their heart to him, if they ever, again, after they've tried everything else in the world and nothing else has filled that God-shaped void that God has placed in everybody's heart, everybody has it. They're going to try to fill it with something. They will try to fill it with some kind of religion. They'll try to fill it with some kind of cult. They'll try to fill it with some kind of uh, pill or alcoholic drink or women or men or whatever uh, they want, and they just come empty all the time, and they're having to search and seek and look and hear and listen and follow the crowd, and they just have this God-shaped void, and if we would just introduce them to the Lord, then they will come to know him because they know they're empty inside. And when you know that someone who has at one time or another professed Jesus as their Savior and Lord and they've walked away from him, they are usually some of the most miserable people in the world, the most unhappy, unfulfilled, just clueless. They don't have purpose. They wander. They're just incomplete. But they have Christ in their heart but they just haven't really given their whole life over to the Lord. And once that happens, you will become a new creation, not only because of your heart and your head, but it will change everything about you, and you won't be the same. And so his mission was to bring God to Israel and bring Israel back to God. His message was really... 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 37. Now, this is when he's already poured the water all over the ox, all over the wood. There's a trench full of water, and I'll get to the, again, actual contest in a moment. But in verse 37, he says, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. You see, he understood that he was just a man and he was on a mission, but his message was clear. Let the people know that you are God. Show them that you are God, and the people will come back if you show them that you are the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, all things are possible God, because that's what they needed to hear and see because they had gotten so immersed in their culture that they had given up on Hashem. They've given up on Yahweh or Jehovah. And so his message was, oh God, hear my prayer. And it wasn't for himself. It was so that the people would come to know God again like they once had. And because of their culture, now let's go beyond before they were in captivity, they understood their culture before. Well, Jews have always known their culture. Jews have never forgotten where they've come from. That's the beauty of our tradition, and that's the beauty of our history. You see, you can't rewrite Jewish history. 
like the world is trying to do now with American history. It's, it's going to get butchered up and it's going to be so confusing that there are going to be people walking around going, we don't know who's real, who's what, what's up, what's down, anything goes, and really, it's going to be really goofy. I mean, I thought it was really goofy when they were protesting this year and uh, they pulled down the statue of Abraham Lincoln. I'm thinking they don't know a thing about history, do they? And so the Jews know their history. It's ingrained in us. It's a part of our DNA. And so what Elijah was crying out was so that the people would come back to God. And he says that so that they uh, and that you have turned their hearts back again. God, turn their hearts back again to you. That should be our prayer for all of the things that have gone on in the last year or two. COVID has turned people's hearts away from God. And we need to pray that God turns their hearts back again to God. Because if they have survived the pandemic, they should be grateful people, appreciative, and that churches are now open, that they can assemble together, which is our right. And we should be unashamed of sharing with them that you may need to recommit your life to the Lord. Because you may not have been living for the Lord the last year or so, and God has spared your life. And you should be grateful and appreciative that we're meeting together, that the doors are open, that you can come out and praise and worship the true and living God. I, I just think our message should be for people, Lord, turn their hearts back to you. And that should be our evangelistic message when we go out. As if we're not trying to put another notch on our gospel belt. Is that we just want to tell people the great news that Jesus Christ loves you, died on the cross, he'll forgive you, and you can go to heaven. It's a really simple message. My little granddaughter that's nine has been preaching it to the whole family since she was five. Whenever we ask her to pray over the meal, she thinks everyone at the table is a non-believer. You know, she, she prays, Lord, save everybody at this table. If they're not living right for Jesus, I pray that they'll give their hearts to Jesus tonight. They've heard enough invitations that they, they almost want to pass the plate and give an open invitation to come forward. And so when we give that invitation to people and tell them how wonderful our God is that all things are possible with him, the message will be clear. The other thing I want to share with you is not only the man, the mission, and his message, but his memory. And that goes to 2 Kings 2.11. You don't have to turn there. This is when God sends the chariot to come and get him. And if I would like to see any event in uh, Bible history, there's a few of them. One is God holding back the Red Sea on both sides until Pharaoh and his army got in the middle and then God let go of the waters and it drowned all of them and killed every single one of them. That's like better than any Bourne Identity movie that I could watch. Just w watched Bourne uh, Ultimatum the other day. I think I've watched that like a hundred times and know the dialogue and when it's going to happen. But man, I would love to see just God holding back the Red Sea and then all of a sudden... Uh, is the last Egyptian over in the water now, deep in? Oh, good. They're out. Okay. And just let the water come. And they're all gone. I mean, eventually they'll find their chariots and they'll find, uh, again, a lot of their armor and things that are in the sea, Red Sea. And so that's one of the events. The other event is to see Elijah taken up in a flaming chariot. I'd like to have been there. And it was going to be a difficult event because he told Elisha, who said, I want your mantle. I want to be like you. And Elijah said, the only way that you can get my mantle and be like me is if you stick by me and see the chariot of fire coming for me. Now, do you think Elisha wanted that? Oh, I believe he did. I believe that when Elijah went to sleep, Elijah slept with one eye open. He said, I'm not going to let this flaming cherry come while I'm sleeping because God is so slick that he could come and take them while I just take a little nap and then, man, I didn't see it and I'm not going to get the double anointing or the mantle of Elijah. Oh, he saw it 
and it changed his life. He did twice as many miracles as Elijah, and Elijah raised the dead. He stopped the rain for three and a half years. He just did so many miracles in regards to uh, showing people the power of God that Elisha came along and did twice as many. So his memory of Elijah is being taken up in a flaming chariot, up, up, and away, and I love that. So let's talk about the contest for just a few moments, and then I want to just wrap it up because tonight, um, you know, people are struggling, and we realize that uh, the news is really never good anymore that you hear um, on television. Deborah and I have uh, haven't watched the idiot box in I think three or four or five days, and uh, we just kind of have been talking and actually, you know, talking. <laughs> when the idiot box is on, you know, we start listening to the idiot box, and we just that's an easy way of not having to communicate. And when you don't have the idiot box on, you sit in a room and read together, and then all of a sudden you find yourself talking to not yourself but to your mate and for the last few days we've talked about everything that you could think of and then when the grandchildren come over we have a lot to talk about when they leave <laughs> after we wake up from a long nap because they wear us out so let me share with you in verse 36, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he didn't say Jacob, but he used Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O God, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then, listen to what happens next, because remember he gave them the team pep talk before he rebuilt the altar that was torn down. He said, I want you to come back to God. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. They started calling on the name of Yahweh, Hashem. They started calling out. They did the right thing. We should understand that. We, we don't make such a big deal out of baptism. There should be a party for every person that gets baptized. You know, because we know in heaven, the angels rejoice over one sinner who gets saved. I have a sense that we're supposed to kind of follow their lead. And when someone enters the waters of baptism, it should be a pretty exciting moment for the body of Christ. Definitely for their family. It should be a big deal. I have grandchildren that are waiting to be baptized. They, they ask all the time, when can I be baptized? Is Brother Joe going to baptize me or, or Saba, are you going to baptize me? I said, if you want Brother Joe to baptize you, we'll lower him into the baptistry and he'll do it. And make sure the heater's on <laughs> so the water's nice and warm. If not, I'll be glad to go in there and I'll love to baptize you because I baptize my children. I want to baptize my grandchildren. And I prayed out seven generations from now that every person that's born into my family or from my family side of the branch will all be born again and be baptized believers that follow Christ till the time they're called home. And so Elijah has all these people falling on their faces. The fire of God falls. And look at verse 40. Then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon. And guess what he did to those false prophets? He killed them all. So he wasn't a wimpy prophet who just kind of said nice things, you know, to make people feel good. He said, God's going to send down fire because I know that all things are possible with my God. And the fact that you were fooled by these individuals for so long, you're not going to have to worry about them any longer because I'm going to kill all of them. Don't let one of them escape. 
And so I want you to know this about Elijah, not only the fact that he was a man on a mission and he brought the message and there's great memories, but the contest that he understood that he was in was to show them that God was real. The God of Israel was real, so they would turn their hearts back to God. I wish there was a way that we could do that in church on a Sunday morning for all the skeptics, for those that watch, that those that listen, that those that hear testimony and they go, well, you know, I'm not that bad, or they compare themselves, I'm not like Charles Manson, and I think I'll make it into heaven. I'm a pretty good person. You know, I put a dollar in the offering plate. You know, I helped someone out. You talked about giving the person on the road a dollar, and, you know, you think that's a great work that's going to make you go to heaven. Um, we need to be able to show folks that our God, all things are possible with him. And so this is the contest, and this is why Elijah knew the fix was in. Number one, consistent reliance. He knew it was possible because he had consistently relied upon God all of his life. There wasn't a time when he said, you know what, I don't think I'm going to trust you, God, or I'm not going to walk with you, God, or I'm not going to be a prophet for you, God or the people of Israel don't like me anymore, I'm the only one preaching your message. He actually thought that, that I'm the only one that really loves you, I'm the only one that's serving you, and God said, no, I have 7,000 prophets hidden in a cave just in case you drop the ball, son. And so he consistently relied upon God. In this moment, don't you think, when he was having this contest and poured water on the ox and the wood and the stones and in the trench, that he had this idea that I could rely on God to take care of fire from heaven? I believe he did. And so not only did he have a consistent reliance on God and knew it was possible, he had a confident relationship with God, and he knew because of that relationship with God, all things are possible. Consistent relationship, confident relationship. And then I believe he had complete reverence for God. Because when he addresses God, he calls him, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And then when he says Israel, he is meaning the people. He's meaning the nation. He's meaning all the descendants of Jacob, all of the tribes of Jacob. Remember, he put 12 stones there to represent all the tribes of Israel so that nobody would be left out. And so there was complete reverence on his part, and God desires that that we have a holy reverence for God. We take that for granted, I think. And I love when I see people who catch themselves, you know. I don't know if they ever do this when Brother Joe's around, but if I'm around a group of people and they may not know that I'm a pastor or even a Christian, that's really more important, and they drop, certain words that they probably know they probably shouldn't drop and they catch themselves and they go, oops, I'm sorry. I realize, you know what, they they have some reverence. That That's an open door for me. That lets me know that they've been to church, someone has taught them, they know right from wrong and they understand that they just said something that probably was offensive. But that gives me a great opportunity to speak to them. And so... Complete reverence for God. Another thing, he constantly rejoiced in God. You know, if you really, as we get into the prayer book and as we get into this understanding of an hour of prayer, you can't go very far in prayer before you start praising God. Man, Elijah loved God so much that he rejoiced in him. He praised him. He, he worshiped him. He loved him. And it was constant. He knew that God was going to send down fire on a wet piece of meat and on wet wood and on wet rocks and on the dust of the ground and even fill the trenches and take care of all of that. He was, he was probably laughing in his heart knowing what God was going to do and that these guys had no idea what God was going to do because all things are possible with God. He had this idea that, you know what, I can't wait to rejoice after God shows the children of Israel. Remember, he got him in a huddle before the contest and said, listen, 
I'm praying that God turns your heart back to God and you turn your heart back to God so that you're in a right relationship again. That's the ministry that God has called us to. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. It's rebuilding a bridge so that someone who doesn't know God could come across the bridge and know God. And so this constant rejoicing was a part of his life. I love, I love our worship. I love worship anywhere I go. I just love it. I remember when um, I was in uh, Thailand and we were going to Vietnam, but we kind of took a little boat tour and ended up in Laos, which that's really not the most beautiful city in the world. And they have a floating market, and uh, we went through the floating market, and then we said, let's, well, let's just come up on the beach for a moment. And we saw, like, a hut, and we walked in the hut, and you wouldn't believe it, but there was someone in the hut playing a Casio keyboard and about an 85-year-old woman dancing to praise songs that we sing in America. And she wasn't conscious of the fact that we were there. She was just so caught up in worshiping God. And I'm thinking, here I am on the other side of the world in a tiny little village. And we just show up and there's someone playing praise choruses on a Casio keyboard with batteries because they didn't have electricity. And this woman, 85 years old, is just dancing around in the tent by herself. There was no one else there. And she was just dancing before the Lord. She was so happy. She, was almost, she almost had a heart attack when she opened up her eyes and saw us. She was like, whoa, you know, I, I don't know what she could have thought, but I, I know that she didn't know what to think. And we couldn't communicate with her because none of us spoke Laotian. And so we just said, praise the Lord. She understood that. We said, hallelujah. She understood that. We said, Jesus. She understood that. And she started getting happier and happier. And the keyboard player, it was like it being in a black church when they start getting riled up a bit. So the keyboard player started playing the chords, and she started getting excited. And about 85 years old, she kept hearing us saying, praise the Lord, Jesus, hallelujah, the blood. And she just started dancing around. It made us get up and do the same thing. Thing. I was like, man, I don't want her to dance alone. I danced with her. Then the other four men I was with started dancing with her. We had a great time. We got back in the boat and said, man, that was incredible, wasn't it? No one would ever believe that we went to, you know, first of all, Thailand and tried to get to Vietnam, and we end up in Laos, and we find this hut, and they're playing praise songs in a tent with a Casio keyboard and an 85-year-old lady dancing and, and praising God. Man, it was awesome. Constant rejoicing in God. It's possible. And I think Elijah understood the character of the children of God because in his, I, in his mind, I think he, he revealed to them what they needed to know and see. And, and if you remember his prayer here, he says, guess what? Turn your hearts back to God. The fire fell in verse 39. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They kept repeating it. We only have it written there a few times, but in the Hebrew, it, it's written in a way that it means it was almost like a repetitive song. They kept saying, they kept saying it over and over and over again. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And they just kept realizing, you know what? We've been worshiping false gods, and we have God. We understand the God of Abraham. We understand the God of, of Isaac. We understand the God of Israel. And so they came back. So tonight, I'd like to close with an invitation. Because I know all things are possible with God, I know that if you're here tonight, you don't have to reveal anything to any counselor or any pastor, but go to the altar because he is God and all things are possible with him. And you may, may be looking for an answer. You may need to come to the altar and say, Lord, I, I need an answer. 
And if you're suffering, in James it says, if any of you are suffering, uh, just ask for wisdom and God will give it to you liberally so that you understand that your suffering is not in vain, but that you may understand what it may be teaching you through it or give you the grace that is sufficient to make it through. And we just have to know that with our God, all things are possible. Maybe you need a touch from God. I believe those people that saw the fire come down from heaven and, and consume the ox, the wood, the rocks, the dust, and lick up the water that was in the trench, I have a feeling they didn't go back to worshiping Baal. Well, they couldn't. They killed all 400. Elijah just went on a tear. He just killed 400 of them by himself. He said, just round them all up, bring them down here to the river, and, you know, that, that put a whole new spin on down at the river, bring them down to the river. Not, you know, like the guy that said, I lived out van by, down by the river. He, he said, bring them prophets down to the river, and he killed every single one of them. Maybe you need God to move in your life again. Maybe you need to move towards him so he can move towards you. If any man will draw near to me, God says, I will draw near to them. Sometimes it just takes that one step and God carries you the rest of the way. Sometimes we feel like maybe there's just something else. There has to be something else. And you're not satisfied or you just feel, you know, I, I have Christ in my heart. I read the Bible. I pray. I praise, I go home, I come back a week later or I come midweek service. You're the faithful. I don't need to preach to the choir that's here tonight. But, you know, there may be things in your life when you go home and you say, you know what, I, I'm just not satisfied in some areas of my life. Ask God to satisfy you. I believe he gives us the desires of our hearts, especially when they're in line with his will, perfect will. And I believe that God wants to deliver some of us. You know, deliver us from evil. God help us. Some of us need help. And I want you to know, because all things are possible, when God makes you complete, you are lacking absolutely nothing. You don't need a second or third or fourth baptism. You don't need to be able to jump pews. You don't need to be able to do anything but just come to Christ and know that in Christ you're, in t you're totally completed, lacking absolutely nothing, and join heirs with an inheritance. And I believe that when Elijah was done with this little contest, if you read on, he tells Ahab, hey, it's going to rain. And he goes, what are you now, a weatherman, Elijah? And Elijah goes, no, it's going to rain, trust me. And so he sends his servant to go look to see if there are any rain clouds. Now, I believe his servant might have been Elisha because remember now, Elisha had to follow him everywhere he went so that he would get the blessing. So he goes up and he looks and he says, you know what, boss? I don't see anything. It's clear skies, not even a cloud, nothing. He says, go up again and look. He goes, nope, there's absolutely nothing. He says, go up again. He says, well, way off in the distance, I see a cloud that's about the little size of a man's hand. He says, go tell Ahab to get his chariot and get down from the mountain because in just a few moments, God is going to open up the heavens and it's going to rain and he won't be able to go down once that rain comes down. And sure enough, after three and a half years, the man that shut down heaven and the rains prayed and it rained on the people again. Man, I want God to rain down on us. I want the rain. I want to, I want to be, I, I don't know about you, but our daughter, we call her a puddle person. If she sees a puddle, she has to jump in it. We, she could be dressed up have good shoes on, doesn't matter. In her, So if I say don't do it, I know she's fixing to run and jump both feet in the puddle. 
I want to be a puddle person too. Send the rain, Lord. Send it rain and we will walk in it and enjoy it. Stand with me if you will. All things are possible with our God, Elijah. It was such a powerful story. I hope if you've never read it that maybe uh, you'll be compelled to go back and look at that chapter and then how he not only won the contest but opened up the heavens and it rained and it was a beautiful sight for everybody to see the rain. I bet everyone came out of their homes and just kind of looked up and if, like a little kid they just put their head back and open their mouths and let the rain just kind of hit their face and go in their mouth and they were pretty happy because they hadn't seen a raindrop in three and a half years so I pray that we're that thirsty for God Ushers, would you come at this time, and, and if you did not uh, have an opportunity or you did not give this coming this past Sunday, that you can give this evening as well, okay? Pray for my wife's mom. They did cancer treatment on her today, and she didn't do well, so... They moved her from the treatment area of the hospital to the emergency room, so we hadn't heard back from them yet. So Susan was just waiting to hear because she, if she goes to the hospital, she has to stand in the parking lot. So weird year. Okay, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we <clears throat> thank you for your word tonight, Lord. Lord, we just pray tonight, Lord, that as our church opens back up, that people would come back to you. We know that you're still here, Lord, and and uh, you have things for us to do and and uh, people for us to witness to. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to bless this church and bless every uh, church of yours, Lord, the pastors and the staff. We just pray, Lord, that you just encourage them, give them the uh, tools to work with, and uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for this this church and what it means to us. We pray that you be with us often now, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a call comes ringing for the restless ways and the light.
Let us not have grace made everywhere on the And a Christ like spirit everywhere be found in the all stand let's sing as we're dismissed god bless you don't forget hey sunday i think it's time change sunday right oh boy oh boy okay this sunday don't forget sherry hargis's funeral this saturday as well 10 o'clock here i'm sorry this friday as well 10 o'clock here at the church the visitation will be from 9 to 10 but the service actually be at 10 o'clock okay Say yes, oh yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, oh yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree. And my answer. Say.